All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Cobham Crew with Phil. That's right, at Chelsea Youth, bringing us all the knowledge about the Academy at Chelsea. And Phil, uh, we've got our version of Keep Sell Alone because when you're talking about young players, it's a little bit different. And I think it's important to caveat that right at the top. Like we try to, but especially with this one, it ain't the same. <laughs> it's really not the same. No, a, a lot of players, uh, they're all really between the ages of 17 and, and 21, 22, as we're talking. And you can group them into sort of keep sell loan as, uh, as a concept, but it doesn't really work like that. They're all on different stages of development. Uh, and their, their next steps are going to be wildly different to what we might talk about at first team level so we're going to go through the players and we're going to discuss what comes next for them um and go from there really yeah absolutely and like think about it the amount of players i mean do you have a count because i know you have these amazing databases of like how many different players played for these teams throughout the season like there's so much movement between 16s up to 18s 18s to dev we have the u21s with champions league like there's a lot going on, and even not not as much as we wanted to, but dev squad to the first team squad as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, across the PL2, the EFL Trophy, the UEFA Youth League, the Under-18 League, the Under-17 Cup, the FA Youth Cup, there were some 70 matches this season for the academy. Um, we might be talking a, a group of 40 to 45 players, and this is just rough off my head, and that's a lot of football to be played and a lot of players to cycle through the system and that's ignoring those who were exclusively on loan you had some who split their season between the development squad and and, and loan and some who were out all together and we're going to be talking about some of those today but there's there's a decent number of players to get through yeah all right well good caveat there um might we well let's see the dev squad we have the we have the futures bucket here right we've got um we've broken them down to people who have done their first loan uh, who are going to be continuing on the loan journey, the core kind of 23, 24 season dev squad who are there throughout the, the season, people who you think might be moving on. And then obviously players who were leased, AKA the club has decided that their time has come to an end and they will, I guess they look at their options, but isn't there a chance some of them come back and we can maybe wait for that section if you want. Yeah, we can get into them. There's one or two who the club will have extended offers to, and are waiting to see whether that player accepts it. They are out of contract. And then the majority of that will be this natural parting of the ways that happens at every club up and down the country at this time of year where the the club don't want to extend the offer of a contract. The player recognises that some of them have already gone on trial somewhere else and they'll, they've given, been given the freedom to explore the next step in their career. And that's a natural part of it. They've served Chelsea well. They've had a, a, a tremendous experience coming through Cobham and it's time for them to, to go and, uh, and forge on in their career somewhere else. All right. Well, first loans bucket to kick it off. I appreciate you starting where everyone should start. And that's in the goalkeeper position with Gaga Slonina. Came from the Chicago Fire. American, obviously big name for us American fans. And uh, he, you know, came in. So you're putting him in the first loan buckets. Is that right? Yeah, this is a bucket for players who we now expect to go out on their first loans in the season to come. And while Slonina was technically on loan with the Chicago Fire when Chelsea signed him in August. It wasn't a loan move in the way that we would ordinarily talk about it. It was a, a change of terminology from what he's rep- what, what his time at Chicago became. Um, and then when he came into Chelsea in November and started playing for the development squad in January, this was him becoming a Chelsea player. So now we approach this summer as this opportunity for him to go and perhaps play somewhere else. And while we have uncertainty about the futures of Kepa and Edward Mendy in the men's first team and the possibility that Slonina can end up as part of the, the, the three-headed monster with Marcus Bettinelli and whoever may be the supposed number one, when you're a young goalkeeper, you want to be playing regular football. He's proven that he can play to a fairly high level in MLS particularly for one so young we're talking we're going to talk about some of these other teenage goalkeepers at Chelsea and they play at a lower level than MLS with respect to all of them his MLS experience sets him up for a potentially more interesting and a higher level loan than your average 18 year old goalkeeper would get he's in performances at the under 20 world cup for the US national team will have only strengthened his position. So you could look at something like an Eredivisie move or a Bundesliga 2 move or somewhere in the EFL Championship. You're going to 
have to find the right fit because not a lot of clubs are prepared to give a teenage goalkeeper of any denomination that level of responsibility and you kind of saw at Southampton this year that if you give them the Premier League opportunity someone like Gavin Bazunu it can go really really wrong for the club and for the player so they need to pick it carefully but he's ticked all the boxes since Chelsea agreed to sign him last August and I think he'll be a goalie in demand this offseason. Any idea how th- how high you think his loan level could go? I think the highest I would be prepared to go for is the EFL Championship, which is a really, really high standard. Uh, and you get a 46-game season there, which means you get a lot of football and a lot of opportunity. Um, we've seen Chelsea go in there with a couple of goalies, but most of them will be in at League One level. We've seen Jamie Cumming go in there, Lucas Bergstrom go in there. Nathan Baxter has been into the Championship, unfortunately, and we'll get to him later. Injuries have kind of stunted his progress the last couple of years. They all had the bodies of work leading up to it. And now while Slonina does have that from his time at MLS uh, and in Chicago, he is still pretty young. And you might want that sort of bridge loan somewhere like the Eredivisie to get him another season of senior football under his belt in a different environment before you then explore a championship opportunity. And I don't think there's any need to rush it either. He's not going to be the number one for the Chelsea men's first team this season unless something goes wrong in the pursuit of Mike Mignon or Andre Onana or whoever. And if Chelsea decide to use this as a purely developmental, experimental season where you play Andre Santos, you play Carney Chuck Womack, and you give them all of the minutes in, in lieu of signing your headline banner, 70 million players in midfield up for running goal or whatever, that seems an unlikely path to take, in which case you then find the best route for Slonina to climb the next rung of the ladder. All right, appreciate that. Obviously, one closest to my heart. Uh, next up, though, we have a bucket of defenders that you think are going to head on loan. I've just got Josh Brooking. You've got Alfie Gilchrist and Zach Sturge. Yep, all of whom were mainstays in the development squad for Mark Robinson last season. And because they were such, you would argue that not all three of them need to stay around for another season. They all played 20, 25 games last season. Um, they're all pushing. Uh, Brookings already over 20. Al- Alfie's going to get there, and Zach's a little bit younger. So if they decide, for example, Zach needs to stay for another half season as the bridge, uh, as an experienced head to what will be a young development squad as it is on paper this season, then he might be the one who doesn't immediately go out. But there's a case for all of them to go out, probably to a League One sort of loan. You might see somebody in League Two, which isn't necessarily a standard. That's the English fourth tier. It's not usually a standard that Chelsea will target for their outfield youngsters. Sam McClelland went in there this season at Barrow and did very, very well. But I think he's a bit of an exception to the rule because he's a bit of a throwback centre-half and he meshed perfectly with the the Barrow playing style. So they'll they'll try to investigate that. And I wouldn't rule out overseas loans. Again, Eredivisie is usually quite a nice introductory loan into senior football because it's a less physically intense league there's far less pressing from the front across the entire league um we've seen many many a chelsea uh, youngster of decades um the last decade go to vitesse when that relationship was established and it served as as a nice transition that doesn't that relationship no longer exists but the the clubs are out there and the networking opportunities are there um alfie of course was on the bench for the men's first team towards the end of the season recognition for a season very well done PL2 player of the year nominee across the entire league Josh Brooking right centre half you know two or three or as a right back his versatility helps and Zach did that equivalent on the left side finishing the season as a centre half in a in a flat back four which was new to him but he did really well and reportedly worked pretty closely with John Terry in that capacity to as a bit of a mentoring thing a bit of guidance and leadership and his physical stature so lends itself to it really well so I think you'll see at least two of those three really strongly considered for a loan there are players coming through behind them uh, who we'll get to when we talk about the development squad who need the opportunity to assume their minutes and it's the right time for them to move on uh, you, you wouldn't necessarily rule out a permanent departure for them. I know there's interest in it. Josh Brookings' contract was due to be up this summer. As I understand it, the club had a, an option to extend it, but trigger a one-year extension, which I believe they've taken up, but that could also lead to a permanent departure if you were so inclined and the right offer came along for club and player. Makes sense. And I forgot Dylan, Dylan Williams was in that defender bucket as well. He really is. And him and Sturge arrived relatively close together for 
ostensibly the same position as a left back or a left wing back but their versatility is such that they've been able to coexist quite well one of them as the left side is center half in a three with the other as the wing back outside them dylan's played a little bit as uh further forward on the left or the right wing and uh, zach as we were saying plays as center half at times and they're all at that point where they've played enough development football that you want to get them out and and really challenge them to a higher level now. I don't think there's a lot for them to learn in development squad, but you might keep one of them around to to be the guiding hand to the next youngsters who come through and then reconsider when we get to the winter window. And I remember Dylan came from um, Derby uh, last year. I remember and that. He's had, kind of... he's had a taste of senior football there. Mm-hmm. When they were going through a serious financial crisis, they ended up having to use essentially their under-21s and under-18s in league matches and an FA Cup match. And he acquitted himself pretty well at the time, which gives you the confidence that two years later, with more development and a bit more maturity, and that's not to say he was immature before, it just comes to all young players, that he'd be able to go out and handle himself pretty well. All right, midfielders, you got, uh, let's see, Ben Elliott, Omari Hutchinson, who's a bit of an attacker winger, Dion Rankin, who uh, is more of a winger, Charlie Webster, a proper center mid, uh, who, remember, he was on the verge of leaving. Chelsea got him on an extension. You've got this group ready to head out on loan. Yep, I would be very surprised if any of them turned out for the development squad next season. Whether they remain Chelsea players by the end of the window or not is all up in the air. So Charlie has been widely expected to leave despite extending his deal back in January by an additional year to 2024. The latest reports coming out of the Netherlands that he's close to a loan to Heronveen, who earlier in the calendar year hired uh, Kenneth Zandelit as their chief scout for first team operations. And Kenneth came straight from a scouting role at Chelsea so we'll have a lot of familiarity with the academy players and with Charlie in particular uh, the the interesting thing there of course is if Charlie is going on loan to Heronvane it would require I think uh, an extension because Chelsea don't tend to like loaning players out in the last year of their deal especially uh, a high-end talent like Charlie who you could risk losing for free at the end of it if you do so so whether that materialises or not, the, the, the tone of the conversation has changed to be alone and, and perhaps Charlie adds another year on to 2025. Contract expiry gives everybody a bit more time to breathe and to figure out their options. We'll have to wait and see there. But it's, it's shifted a little bit from this expectation that he may be more likely to leave permanently this summer than not. I think it's maybe 50-50 at this stage, so we'll wait and see there. And then with the other boys, um, Ben Elliott has come through the last two years playing regular football after a torrid torrid time with injuries between the ages of 15 and 18 been able to see his quality close at hand influential as anybody else in the development squad this season and this past weekend as we record he is now a senior international having made his debut for the Cameroon national team Uh, Ben Elliott as a name doesn't immediately strike you as being Cameroonian he has Cameroonian family and parentage Um, and that's it's it puts him on the map a little bit as well um can immediately market yourself as a senior international having had no senior club experience yet he's another one who would suit perhaps a less combative style of football than you find in the championship and league one in england and that's not to say that he can't handle himself in there because he's proven he can at pl2 level but as that first step going into the dutch league allowing him to really showcase his technical ability would be really really good for him you could if for example a, a deal with Strasbourg as a partner club uh, materializes in time for the summer playing in the French second tier could be really good for him uh, a league that particularly exposes a lot of um, Cameroon internationals he'd be playing in the same environments as some of the players he's playing with now at senior international level these are all these opportunities to come but I think there'll be a, a long queue of suitors for him and then you've got the, the wide players, Amari Hutchinson, Dion Rankin. Amari was reportedly very close to a loan to West Bromwich Albion Championship uh, back at the end of the January window, a deal that supposedly fell through logistically because all of the time and attention was taken up with the Enzo Fernandez deal. So the Hakim Ziyech deal fell through as well. And further down the chain, the Amari deal didn't go through. Whether that's apocryphal or not, whether it happened or not, is neither here nor there now, but... It's a reflection of the level they intended him to go in at, at the time and the level he'll probably go to this summer championship 
season, 46 games, a great chance for him to thrive uh, and take that next step that he was ready for last summer when Chelsea signed in from Arsenal. He was an outstanding PL2 player and he went on and did the same thing this year. Made his senior debut at Chelsea that he didn't get to do at Arsenal, but has also now seen Michalo Mudrik and Noni Madueke signed. Christopher Nkunku is due to arrive and there'll be no doubt more reshuffling in the in the ranks ahead of him so going out and getting some football is about right for him as it is for Dion Dion Rankin who plays at right right wing back right wing left wing back left wing impactful up and down both sides and you'd probably target League One in, in England for him because in the EFL Trophy games against the likes of Oxford and uh, similar teams in, in previous seasons he's proven that he can be a handful for players of that level um, and you, you, when you talk about a player who could theoretically get championship football you take the risk of not playing by going into a higher level versus going in at a safer level one tier below and really shining straight off the bat because you can at least reevaluate mid-season when you've had 20-25 games under your belt by the winter window Whereas if you go in at the championship, you might struggle to get in. You might only play five or six games in those first five or six months, depending on how strong the team you go into is. And then all the momentum you've built up in academy football is harder to come by. And there are pros and cons to doing that. Someone like Xavier Simons, for example, had offers from League One and League Two last summer and went in at Hull in the championship. And a few eyebrows were raised as to whether he was up for the standard. And personally, I thought he was. Now, he didn't get to play there, but he parlayed that into a permanent move, which may have been the vision he had last summer that he knew that was on the table. So these things are going to be factored into everyone's decision-making. So you could go out now, play 40 times for a third-tier side in England with no prospect of signing for them permanently because with due respect you see yourself playing at a higher level or you can take the short-term pain for the long-term gain by going getting less immediate football but there's a deal on the table for you to become a permanent part of them and in 24-25 you get your minutes at a club that then own you yeah i mean i it's it's really interesting with a couple of these obviously i think you've even said last season Amari hutchinson was too good for this level probably had a hint at that when he came from arsenal as well uh, I just look West Brom looked like a very competitive championship team. Um, they, you know, so it would have been probably a safe space for him to play. Uh, we'll have to see, you know, there, there's, there's definitely, um, some interesting, like you said, these loan moves are so important and technical to, to kind of the next step. The last one you have for a loan is Mason Burstow. Uh, the gold machine himself, um, really led the line for the team. You had a lot of good things to say about him this season, scoring goals is the hardest thing to do so when you think about setting him up for success you know i listen to the peter crouch podcast and he talks about how it took him a couple loans right to really kind of figure it out um where do what do you think is a good fit for mason yeah you said he had a good season and i had some good things to say which i did for me he was probably my uh pl2 dev squad player of the season in a close four battle with a handful of others and we talked about Slonina having had senior experience before arriving at Chelsea. Now, Mason does as well. Chelsea signed him from Charleston, where he had a, a bit of a breakthrough campaign in, in League One. And you might immediately think sending him back to League One on a loan wouldn't necessarily serve a purpose two years later. But I think in the first instance, it very much might, because it gives you a frame of reference where he was before you signed him and where he is after a year plus of elite environment development. Has he taken all of that on board and can he apply it going back into the same level of football? It doesn't have to be Charlton as, a, as an exact comparison, but a, a, a team playing at the same level, does he now go back in and become one of the foremost centre forwards in the league? You can then reevaluate what you do with him in the winter window if he has hit the ground running and proves himself way too good for that level. But I think it's an interesting starting point for him to go back into the standard that Chelsea signed him from, where he was incredibly raw uh, as an impact sub for a team that wasn't necessarily having the best of times and have gone on to uh, pretty much perform the same way in his absence. And they've used various other youngsters, including, in an ironic twist of fate, a striker called Miles Leeburn, who was at Chelsea until he was under 16, left and went to Charlton around the same time that Mason came to Chelsea. Mason's done well at Chelsea. Miles has done well for Charlton. The Leeburn name is legendary down at Chelsea. His father and his mother are, are legends at the club in various different capacities. But it's quite interesting to see that play out. And if now Mason, having had a year at Chelsea, goes back into 
the the third tier and, and lights it up, then you can see the value of having had that move to Chelsea, and you can build from there. I think he could be useful at a higher standard in a really strong squad playing a bit more of a rotation role than the leading man. But as, as a nine at Chelsea this year, he showed everything you want from your number nine. He works hard on and off the ball. He runs the channels. He's a good, good link-up player and he scores goals. So I think he's one to, to look out for. Again, the the centre-forward position in the men's first team at Stamford Bridge is far from clear. And there's a lot to shake out over the next year. So a good loan for him. Could see him return this time next summer with um, a stronger case for inclusion. Yeah, I love to hear it, uh, especially with the number nine, Miss Tammy, uh, the good old uh, Dev Squad uh, products. But anyways, we're going to take our first ad break. When we get back, we're going to those that might be continuing the loan journey. So thank you to the sponsors, and we'll be right back. All right, continuing the loan journey, those who have experienced a loan but feel thinks they might benefit from another one. No surprise here. A ton of goalkeepers, uh, Eddie Beach, Lucas Bergstrom, Teddy Sherman Lowe. Uh, between the, the teams and the loans, Phil, we'll, we'll get to some of the other goalkeepers later. Chelsea are stacked, aren't they, in terms of the like quantity of goalkeepers on their books in the academy? They do, um, and they are. There's plenty of them. There's some that haven't played nearly as much as they may have liked over the last couple of years and will probably be leaving permanently this summer. But the three that you've just mentioned there had really interesting times on loan this season. And while you had Lucas Bergstrom play for Peterborough in League One, the third tier, you had Eddie Beach and Ted Sharman Lowe go in to the sixth tier. Despite all of them being of a relatively similar age and relatively similar levels of experience, now, Lucas did really well for Peterborough in the first half of the season before coming back into Chelsea that then allowed Beach and Sharman Low to go out. The return wasn't necessarily for that reason. It ended up serendipitously coming together like that. He did really well for Peterborough, particularly August and September, and then the team started to flounder a bit. They had a change of manager, and some of Lucas's performances weren't as good as they had been. That loan will serve him well and gives you sort of a, a baseline that he can go back into League One and do really well. Still has some technical issues to clear up because he's so tall, he's six foot nine, and getting down to some of the lower shots, as we've discussed before, isn't as easy for him as it is. I'm not saying six foot four is short, but when you're six foot nine, everybody's shorter than you. And you do have some of those issues to, to tidy up, and that's what the loans are there for. Um, he is now a senior Finland international with the caveat that it came in a non FIFA window match which meant that the pool of players that Finland and Sweden were picking from for those games was smaller it was mostly domestic based or youth based that's not to discredit the opportunity but it kind of puts the context in that while he has one cap for Finland and being a regular under 21 Eddie Beach has se uh, several caps for Wales under 21s and in the right circumstances may have received a similar opportunity for Wales Wales and Finland being teams of relatively comparable international stature Eddie went into Chelmsford City, who were pushing for promotion from the National League South, which is the same division that Sharman Lowe and Haven from Waterloo were playing in. They both did really well and set themselves up for, at the very least, a National League opportunity one step above the English fifth tier, still two divisions below Bergstrom. And the question that I'm asking myself is, what's the difference between the three of them? Because when they've all played development squad football, they've all looked relatively similar in terms of ability, performance, consistency, and I can't speak to potential, but they're all youth internationals. Ted's England under 20 and the other two are under 21s. They've all been through the same sort of journey on the same sort of timeline, but one of them has been given the opportunity to play three tiers higher than the other two. I don't know if that's going to play out in the summer because reputations sometimes speak loudest, but I, I was encouraged by what I saw from Eddie in the development squad in the first half of the season. I was encouraged what I saw from Teddy last season he didn't play the first half of this season through injury and then went out to Haven they both played 20 odd matches in their loans in the National League South and did very very well for good teams and will have a lot of opportunities ahead of them I think you could easily push for a League 2 opportunity if you were both of those and be aggressive with it knowing that you may end up in a job share situation with a more experienced goalie and may the best man win we've seen that before with someone like Nathan Baxter when he was down at Yeovil he made that job his own very quickly despite the presence of more senior goalies 
Um, but I thought it was an interesting thing for players that have played at the same standard for the last year and a half, two years, um, to then receive quite disparate first loan destinations. It'll be really, really curious from my perspective as to what happens to each of them this summer. I love a goalkeeper story. Uh, to your point, the levels and the things, and at the end of the day, you got to play, all right, and show consistency and show growth. It's not like a field player where you can just train really well. Like that's the biggest thing I try to drive home with all these is it's a goalkeeper you have to play. No training replicates the pressure of being in a game. So um, to, your, to your point, like hopefully they're kind of figuring out the levels and things like that. And actually I was looking around on the website. They actually they have a, an article that says, why do Chelsea send goalkeepers on loan to non-league? And this was on non-league day back in March. So I'm actually going to circle back and see what they have to say. Uh, on the official site. Uh, but it's a really good article that I'd encourage people to read because it, it t touches upon some of these subjects. And there was a, a little piece with Max Merrick, who we haven't included here because he's not formally part of the dev squad. He was one of the rare under-18s that went out on loan. The under-18s had three goalies in the same competition. And so one of them is missing out all the time. Uh, and Max had the opportunity to go out and play at a, a level, I believe, one tier below where Beach and Sharma Lowe were playing at. He was at Hanwell Town, which is pretty local to me, actually. Um, and he did really well there as a 17-year-old. And he could only speak highly of the opportunity that he got to go out and really accelerate his development there. So uh, we're talking about a young development squad next season. He may have taken more of a leap through doing that in his first year as a scholar than he would have staying around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, uh, defender time, you have Basher Humphreys, right? And we got to see, uh, his, he has some awesome hair that he flashed in the, uh, the debut in the FA Cup tie against Man City. Uh, he'd been training with the Graham Potter side, ended up going on loan. Um, he looks like a defender, Phil. I mean, he looks the look, he looks like you don't want to mess with him. Um, you know, he's got that kind of hard nose edge to him. He's got great size. Uh, get us up to date on Bosher. Yeah, he went into the German second tier um, at Paderborn, which might strike people as not the most obvious of connections to make with Chelsea. But Benji Weber, who was on Thomas Tuchel's uh, backroom staff during his time at Chelsea, went in there as sporting director after they all um, left Chelsea last September. And so he had relationships at Chelsea and prior knowledge of Bash and so when they came to the winter window and they needed defensive reinforcements they went in there and it's, it's a pretty good standard of league as well it's it's not super high but what you do get playing in the German second tier is you get to play in some pretty good stadiums in front of pretty sizable crowds you've got someone like Hamburg that are still down there year after year one of the biggest clubs in Germany and Paderborn have recently been in the Bundesliga um, as a relegation candidate, but they've got a good stadium, a good number of fans, and Bash went in and, and and really hit the ground running, played superbly as far as I understand it, in, in various defensive capacities, including some time a fullback or wingback, which isn't his forte, but he can do that and he can play in midfield. And then he went into the Under-20 World Cup with England, scored there and established himself as a, a very, very reliable presence in, in that defence alongside a guy like Ronnie Edwards, who Chelsea have reportedly tried to sign before, and he plays regularly in the English third tier, attracting interest from levels higher above. So if you assume that they're on a similar development grade, you might look at a Bundesliga loan. You might look at a championship loan. We're talking about that calibre because he came in and fine, his debut at Chelsea was not the most ideal of circumstances because it was a way to Manchester City in the FA Cup in a game that they knew they were going to lose, but he, he didn't look at out of place among many other troubled teammates. Uh, he's very confident, quietly confident. He knows, knows what he can do and knows what he can contribute. And I think we'll probably see an ambitious loan for him this summer. You could put him in the championship, which is the, the level that I think a lot of people immediately think of as the the high watermark for 95% of prospects. Levi Cole started in the championship. He went to Huddersfield. Um, and excelled there, and we've seen what's happened to him since. And so, I think you can you can aim really high with Bash, and he's not going to let you down. I love it. Uh, uh, I think just over a thousand minutes played, had an assist uh, in in roughly twelve ma matches in that Bundesliga two season. Uh, Paderborn, I mean, they weren't the worst. Absolutely, I think you like. I looked, they were sixth in the table uh, in Bundesliga two. So, and and that was only February eleventh to May fifth. He got a thousand minutes. So. 
I'd say that's successful at a minimum for him. So really excited to see what he could do. Just seeing him on that Man City match really kind of lit my attention to see what he can do. So again, let's get another loan. Let's kind of continue to prove it out because um, I, I I liked what I saw in the limited minutes, if nothing from like the, the, the technical ability and the physical ability, just to see what he can develop into because there's certain things you can't teach, Phil. Um, Chester A. Cassade is on your loan journey. Same with Harvey Vale. Um, I believe Harvey came back early. Uh, Cicere was at Reading, who had a bit of a rough season, yet he was kind of their shining star throughout that that misery. So those are the next two on the list, and I guarantee every Chelsea fan that's tuned in is going to be listening intently on what happens with these two players. Oh, for sure. Cassidy is the man of the moment. He's the golden ball and golden boot winner from the Under-20 World Cup. Italy fell just short of actually winning the whole thing, but he certainly made his presence felt and um, improved his reputation with his performances in Argentina. He he had a good spell with the development squad, August through to January, and then went to Reading. And as you say, Reading were relegated um, after a points deduction, or they probably would have struggled to stay up had it not been for that. It wasn't the most ideal of scenarios for him to go into. Paul Ince isn't a manager who particularly favours midfield build-up. The ball goes over their heads a lot. Um, that being said, one of the current critiques of Cassidy's game is that he doesn't provide enough on-ball value as a midfield passer um, with his game primarily being around exploiting space, crashing the box, using his tremendous shooting and aerial heading ability to contribute goals in the final third. And let's not forget, that's what the game's all about at the end of the day. You can, you can build a, a pretty strong career off doing that. And he's going to parlay this World Cup into a really high standard of move. It's going to be a top tier league. I don't think it'll be a championship line. You, you could put him into the top end of the championship. So I was looking at this as an experiment earlier, looking at last season, which pro championship clubs, for example, crossed the ball most and who played with a uh, number 10 who can attack. And someone like Middlesbrough were playoff semi finalists under a progressive manager in Michael Carrick, who utilised a lot of crossing. And they had Aaron Ramsey on loan from Aston Villa score a bunch of goals. Now, Aaron Ramsey and Cesare Cassidy are completely different types of players, but were they not to get him back as their number 10, the second striker behind Juba Akpom, uh, someone like Cassidy in there would certainly score a ton of goals for a, a top-end team pushing for Premier League promotion. That's purely speculative on my part and just the sort of thinking of how do you maximise what he brings right now. But you can completely go the other way and say, right, these are the flaws in his game. We know that he has the technical capacity to play as more of a traditional box-to-box -box midfielder. You can see that he can pass the ball, that he's got a range of passing, that he's got the defensive instincts, uh, and you want to improve some of the gaps that people have been critiquing him for. Put him into an environment that challenges him to do that a bit more. You, he could go into half a dozen bottom-half Serie A teams and learn all of that, probably at the expense of the goal scoring just because of the nature of the beast. Um, and you, you want to f strike a nice middle ground between the two. Um and then you, you you compare him to someone like Harvey Vale who played in the same tournament who went into the championship last season at Hull and then got injured very early on came back under a new manager who kind of wanted to keep him the sort of manager that would have done his game uh, wonders Liam Rosini is a younger manager um, very bright very highly thought of and uh, is doing decent things with Hull now but Chelsea brought him back in and couldn't loan him back out for various boring administrative reasons and he we already know what he can do in PL2 he showed it again that just reinforces that he can go back out online probably to another championship team where ideally he doesn't get injured and provides the same sort of production and high level performance as Cassidy is being talked of it's, it's sort of this what have you done for me lately vibe Cassidy is on fire right now everyone's talking about him he's been in a very visible tournament and Harvey played in the same tournament captained England quite selflessly at times again playing in that left wing back position that he can do that isn't his best role but also being a, there were games where he did play in his best role and you know all of what he can do just needs that stage to go and do it in the championship and I'm going to circle back here and throw a third name into it and that's Tino Andrin who compared to Cassidy for example is the complete package 
he can play as the midfielder who can pass, who can orchestrate, and then provides the goals and productions on the end of it. The problem is he hasn't played since September. He went back to Huddersfield after missing the back half of 21-22 through injury, went back in there, started the season like a house on fire, scored two beautiful goals against West Brom, then got injured again and hasn't played since. And it's, it's again, sliding doors moments. Cassaday on the ascendancy and Jurin almost a little bit left behind because spent the less best part of the last two years injured at a really crucial juncture. He's still under contract until 2025. So if you're Chelsea, you don't necessarily want to go separate ways right now because you're selling while his stock is low. And it takes one loan where he, fingers crossed, manages to leave his injury demons behind him, get on the pitch and showcase his undeniable quality. Remember, he's played for the Chelsea men's first team. He made his debut under Frank Lampard and then continued to play a couple more appearances that same season, not look out of place. He played at Barnsley in the FA Cup and did really well. I think off my head, he played in that last game at home to Everton before lockdown, the same one that Armando Breuer made his debut in. He was on that cusp and it speaks to the problem since that he's barely played any senior football. And when you talk about Cassidy, Vale and Andrew, they should all be at the same breakthrough level right now, but because their respective journeys over the last, let's just even say six months, have been so dis- different, people are talking about Cassidy as a sure thing and then questioning whether Vale's right and then writing Andrew in off, and that's not fair on any of them because they've all proven to a, to a very high level compared to other players of their age and similar experiences that they deserve to be in the same bracket and you'd like to see them all have a future at Chelsea but then you look does Cassidy block Andrew does Madueke does Chukwemeka all of the signings that have gone on in the last 12 months at Chelsea Cassidy's included in that are potential obstacles for somebody who may be considering their future at the club We'll have to see, you know, but there is a lot of excitement. That's why I was kind of surprised he got Tino on loan. But again, it's because of his ceiling. You know the level of PL2 versus, um, you know, loan. So uh, I think, you know, I, I even looked again, Phil. Andrin's not on the website, right? He is kind of falling through the cracks. And maybe that's to take him out of the limelight so people ask less questions. Uh, but I think it was, um, you know, there. it's funny. There, there was a lot of interest i think even chandler was like i can't believe you guys didn't talk about tino and ksl i'm like what was to talk about and oh by the way i got phil coming on so don't you worry i'll put him in front of him (laughs) yeah it's it's one of those stories that in another world he's at huddersfield all season long 10 15 goals which is entirely possible goes into the under 20 world cup with england as a a proper game-changing talent like castaday was for italy and we're having that conversation about him right now and the old cliche of the best ability is availability does ring true it's not through his fault at the very least these these things keep affecting him and you just have to cross your fingers and hope that whether it's the Chelsea future or not that that talent and potential gets the opportunity and stage it deserves because it's been a torrid couple of years and uh, you could make the a very strong argument that he might move on permanently this summer a fresh start somewhere else um Talent is talent at the end of the day. It's undeniable. As long as he's on the pitch, she's going to show it. All right. We hope he's there. Also, Harvey, 19. 19 years old. All right. No rush there. We we got a, we got him on our hands. Keep him progressing. Uh, all right. The next bucket you have here is essentially who you think will make up the core of the 23-24 dev squad. You got Hughes, Terranen, Morgan, Castledine, G, Silcott, Dubry, Flower, Stutter, and Matos. My question for you is, are they going to be concerned that they're still in the dev squad or is this the right level? You got to fill the team, obviously. So do you think that anybody there might be a little bit antsy to be returning to this team? Uh, No, I don't think so. I think because they were young. almost all of the, almost all of these boys will, that you've just rattled through there will be in their their first real season at this level. The uh, Castle Dine and Hughes have been up for most or some of last year and then some of the year before as well. And when we were talking earlier about having Josh Brook and Alfie Gilchrist and Zach Serge all go out at the same time, this is kind of why you might be inclined to keep one of them back because it's it's a it's a new group. We, we got very, very familiar with the look of the development squad last year. We ran through all of them in the players that we're projecting out as going on their first loans. You're ripping the core out of the team and you need to make sure that you're still competitive. And so if a Josh Brookin goes out, Brody Hughes assumes the same minutes, the same positional responsibilities on the right side of the defence. Leo Castledine, 
broke in, very influential at times last season, impact sub, scored a bunch of goals towards the back end of the year. He now assumes the the Charlie Webster, the Amari Hutchinson, the Ben Elliott sort of responsibilities as that eight slash ten slash occasional nine or whatever who can score goals and, and lead from the front. Tari Einan has spent most of the last two years injured as well, but kind of came back at the back end of the season, looked like he'd been growing and just spending all of his time in the gym during rehab because he's got this huge presence. He's 6'2", 6'3", really broad, really muscular, elegant left-footed style, and you can do a lot with him if he's on the pitch. And the rest of the boys have relatively little experience by comparison. Jimmy J. Morgan signed from Southampton in January and underwent knee surgery that he found during the medical he would still be eligible to play for the under-18s the next season and play in the Youth Cup, but he's already got basically two years of experience at Southampton at that level and will be expected to go in and lead the line as part of the Dev Squad's attack. And then you've got the the graduates who are coming up. They've had their two years as under-18s, Billy G, Zane Silcott, Louis Flower, Ronnie Stutter, who can all do quite a few things. Billy's a centre-half uh, more often than not, but he's by trade has been a defensive midfielder before that. Zane can be a wing back or he can play in central midfield. Louis Flower is nominally a striker, but like Ronnie Sutter as well, they've got experience playing wide. So you're starting to put pieces together. Um, and Alex Matos, who doesn't actually play for Chelsea, is generally expected to sign as a free agent from Norwich. He's another one who has been a forward for the most part, but is transitioning and becoming uh, a bit more of a central midfield number eight. It's really interesting to try and project the dev squad at this time of year because I'm convinced that they'll add a couple more names to the group uh, or try to find some hand-holding players that are a little bit more PL2 savvy. You don't want to bring players in just for that, but when you p- potentially lose uh, a Gilchrist and Elliot Hutchinson, Rankin, Webster, Williams and Burstow from your, your group because they're going on to bigger and better things, you can't just chuck all the new guys in at once and say, right, sink or swim because it's not conducive to their best development individually or collectively. You want to make sure that you put a competitive product out on the field so that these players can grow in a challenging but successful environment. Uh, They've all done well enough at under-18 level, but it is quite a step up to PL2. You don't want to be in another relegation battle, so you might see a little bit of recruitment around that. You might see uh, a few players jump around a little bit and unexpected moves um, but I think they'll be the core of the squad and then what you do around them is, is that rising tide lifts all boats you need to ensure that these players are put in the best position to showcase their talents and not just spend big chunks of every game picking the ball out the back of their net or defending in low blocks yeah absolutely um, kind of that consistency but again there's a lot of movement to the teams so I get it probably having a bunch of players return that know the league will help uh, I just don't see Neil Bath not signing one again this summer, just like he did uh, last summer. Uh, and oh, they'll, they'll be regre- the they'll be aggressive, absolutely. Yeah, the the marketplace is is so ultra aggressive. With did England you submit your you shopping list? <laughs> uh, one or two names may have been mentioned. Love it. I saw your um, PL two team of the season kind of thread as well. It was really fascinating, also just to look league wide to see just how much damn talent is in is in that yeah that age so that's level. that was the the under 18 team of the season i did a similar exercise three years ago and it's, it's useful to look back on it's not sort of an ego trip or anything but and and, and by uh, i put carney chuck Wemeka in there when he was a 16 year old at aston villa this isn't me finding a diamond in the rough or an unpolished gem everybody knew who carney chuck Wemeka was and it's just one of those things that he stood out and impressed me and i did the same thing this year and mostly because chelsea played in the southern league I was focusing on players that I've seen in person in the flesh and have a lot of knowledge of. I watch a lot of northern section players, but not seeing them in person as frequently as okay. There's a slight difference between what I see with my eyes and what I see on a screen. And if I was to do a separate one of the northern players, it would be quite interesting to see how those come out. But yeah, it's, it's southern focus because it's the level and the opposition that Chelsea play at and you get the exposure to. And you can look that up on Twitter and then in a couple of years' time we can see what those guys went on to do and it's it's a learning process it's a bit of fun at the end of the day just to be able to reflect and to refine individual talent id uh, little things like that all right we're gonna take our last ad break when we get back who do we think is moving on and it's already out there who's been released so plenty more to come thank you to the sponsors and we'll be right back all right phil uh, we've been putting this one off for a little bit who do you think is going to be moving on no surprise more goalkeepers because we have so many yeah so we can split the moving on into the players who are 
at the end of their contracts and unlikely to or pretty much are being released the Premier League haven't published their retained list but a friend of the podcast Nassar Kinsella and various others have reported on players who are expected to leave and then you've got the other ones who aren't out of contract but are at the right times in their career to go and there's a question mark about one or two so someone like Jamie Cumming is 24 in September and has spent the last two years with Milton Keynes in League One uh, very, very good for Milton Keynes in two very weird seasons for them. The first one, they were playoff semi-finalists and he was uh, an integral part of doing that, uh, getting there with them. They went into this past season as promotion favourites and they got relegated. And Jamie probably didn't have as good of a season as before. The, the MK fans were still relatively happy with him. I think he won a couple of end-of-season awards, players, player and all of that, but... Did he hit a ceiling at League One? I don't think he did. I think he's easily a championship goalie moving forward, if not a higher standard than that. But if he's 24 and hasn't had the opportunity to break in and be a backup at Chelsea, you don't want him to be a third choice necessarily. And if someone like Slonina is now the focus moving forward, then maybe Jamie needs to be one of those we spoke about earlier, take that opportunity to, to break away from Chelsea and forge your own path in your own name. Because... He could go into any League One club tomorrow and be the starter next season and probably a couple of championship clubs would be interested too. Uh, similar for Nathan Baxter, who was at Hull the last two years. They had an option to buy. Injuries really impacted his progress. He's the one who's been through every tier from the Metropolitan Police team in the seventh tier and then he went up to Woking and Yeovil uh, and various others on the way through and championship goalie all day long and uh, Nazar wrote earlier uh, over the weekend I believe that he's um, talking to Maccabee Haifa in Israel after discovering his uh, Jewish heritage and eligibility to play for them and that would p potentially be Champions League football for him um, and we've had this thing over the years is Nathan Baxter a future Chelsea goalkeeper I think in, if things had gone slightly better for him with his championship loans he could have made a stronger case but he's older again than Jamie and if he's got championship sorry Champions League opportunities coming his way potentially next season and he has to, absolutely has to explore them he, he, he'll he be reading the stories out there that Chelsea are looking at Maignan or Anana or David Raya or Robert Sanchez or anyone else there's no smoke without a fire and if you're not being talked about as a realistic even backup for Chelsea at this stage in your career and those options are on the table then absolutely go and explore them and proudly so because he's one of the better young goalkeepers that Chelsea have developed in the last few years it's not <coughs> an easy position to develop as you and I have discussed plenty of times with our goalkeeper focuses um, and Chelsea could be rightly proud wherever he ends up um, and we can keep going with the goalies and Sammy Klimsani who hasn't played at all this season he's been around the club on occasion he's trained with another club in Morocco during the winter break I run it, uh, out of nowhere as well um, I don't quite know why he hasn't played because he has been the third goalie on occasion for the development squad and he's been around um, when he has played previously he's looked a little bit short of standard but that was understandable at a time when he came over moved country during the pandemic time with plenty of restrictions on what he could do or where he could go in a new country. Uh, he played a bit last preseason and looked really, really good. And he's very highly thought of. He's had Algeria and Morocco vying for his international allegiances for a while. Um, but I suppose when you do have as many goalies as we've been discussing, you can end up getting lost in the shuffle a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, as I continue to count, many, many, many. Um, one, not to be the lightning rod of the group, but Mendel Irawu um, blew up with that compilation clip on Twitter, drew a lot of eyes. You and I kind of said, hey, well, you, not me, on one of our pods said, hey, just temper expectations, still has a lot of growing developing to do. He's in your moving on list. Yeah, with an asterisk, and so should have been Malik Mothersill, although I've put him in a different section as I'm reading it. Those two are in the same situation, as I understand it. They're both due to be out of contract at the end of this month, and Chelsea have extended offers to them, and it's now up to them whether they take it or seek their fortunes elsewhere. Tudor has so many opportunities on and off the pitch available to him. So depending on who you talk to, he might be off to Italy or to Germany or to arrival of Chelsea but also he might be off to Oxford or Cambridge University 
uh, as a very high academic achiever and trying to, as we spoke before on our last recording, trying to weave all of these things together in his personal and professional lives isn't necessarily easy. Now, Chelsea have made him an offer and the public discourse is what it is about whether that offer has been received in the in the way that it should be or whatnot. But uh, at the end of the day, Chelsea are highly supportive of their players' academic endeavours to a point because they are, first and foremost, a professional football club. And when you put an investment into a player of Tudor's age, at the very least, you expect a prioritisation accordingly. And how this all unfolds, I don't know. It's, it's different for Malik, um, and, and no disrespect, just because he's not a King Scholar at Eton doesn't mean that he's not deserving of the same mm -hmm. platform. He had a, a mixed bag of a development squad season, didn't play as much as I'm sure he would have liked, sometimes through illness and injury, and sometimes just because Mason Burstow was performing as well as he was. When he was on the pitch, he really was impactful. And I think that will play into his thinking that he could go back in this year. We talked about the core dev squad. Jimmy Morgan is coming off the fresh off an injury back into Chelsea for the first time in six years. He left as an 11 year old and figures to be the starting centre forward if Malik isn't staying. But Malik would have the inside track if he does stay, puts together a full season of football and goes and is in the same position that Mason Burstow is now a year from now. But I think he'll have decent opportunities and he did really well in the EFL Trophy. He scored at Peterborough, he scored twice at Leighton Orient. He showed that he can take chances and score goals. His all-round game is still coming along, but he... I, would, I'm not, I don't know if he's going to be a, a big long-term miss for the club because, just because of the way the club operates. But you, you can see why they've extended him an offer because there's, there's, there's a lot of goal-scoring talent in Mother Sill. And I think it's anyone's guess as to what his choice is at this point. Um, my inclination is that if he was going to sign, he would have done so already. But you never say never. It could happen between now and the end of the month that suddenly everything settles down. He wants to stay puts another year on his deal and goes from there but in both cases the longer it drags on the more chance there is that either of them are here day one next season yeah that makes sense uh we learned that with N'Golo Kante unfortunately uh right the released list and kind of the rest we can say not in a in a sliding situation just kind of up in the air not really sure what the next step is but uh Prince Edikoke Ethan Wadey couple of goalkeepers again we've talked about prince uh i've probably uh, probably since the beginning of you and i doing this you know came in high ceiling i believe he came from paris didn't he um no that was sammy he was from paris fc prince has been with right. chelsea since i think he was 14 or something and he had no particular experience he came from grassroots and went straight into chelsea and incredibly physically developed young boy who showed some real strong goalkeeping fundamentals in the youth team at times. There were some mistakes and all, all young goalies do that. But he, like them, suddenly has sort of completely disappeared from the radar this past year. He was on trial uh, at Stoke for a while. He was on trial at QPR for a while. He's been at a couple of other clubs. Clearly, um, he will leave Chelsea this summer and what happens next, we'll, we'll wait and see. But um, yeah, he he's a, a disappointment personally to me. Not disappointment that he's let me down or anything. It's just that what I saw from him was really quite encouraging. And there's so many tools to work with there that if he if and when he goes into another club, I think they've got this raw talent to to work with and mold. And we don't you'd have to rush a goalkeeper. He can be 24, 25, and and then really come into his own at a, a respectable senior level. Uh, I think Ethan Wadey will be very similar. He's a kid who's really got his head screwed on. He's been out on some lower league, non-league loans, um, uh, clubs that a lot of our listeners won't have heard of. And this year he was in at Woking and he played back up there for the first half of the season and came back. A bit of dev squad friendlies, had a trial at Millwall and then ended up on the men's first team bench uh, at Manchester City in the back end of the season because Joao Felix pulled out injured in the warm-up and he travelled as the third goalie. And if nothing else from his time at Chelsea, he ends up on a Premier League team sheet with his name and a shirt and a number. And that's a, a pretty nice way to end up. But he's he's a good kid and whatever he does next, um, he'll be of value to his club as a starter, as a backup. He's one of those glue guys who just is, is great to have in the, in the, in the changing room. <clears throat> and American. So, you know, we were always following him. I think I had my eye on him. So glad to see he's continuing to grow the journey. 
Uh, Abu Castillo, and I think that's it for defenders. And I'm trying to look ahead. McClellan. Henry Lawrence and Sam McClellan. Henry Sam McClellan's Lawrence. definitely a center half, and Henry has been a uh, right back for the most part at Milton Keynes. Uh, Sam was brilliant for Barrow on loan. I think and believe his deal is up and that he's said to be released but I, st- I could stand to be corrected on that either way he's one that uh, would probably move on permanently if he's not out of contract this summer and would strike a deal he did really really well and he is this archetypal lower league defender who heads every ball blocks every shot defenders defender but when you we talk about people like that you almost damn them with faint praise and that they can't play with the ball at their feet now he can you don't hang in the Chelsea Academy system for four or five years as he did without being able to do that there's a a ceiling on how high you can take that but certainly at the level he played at last year and probably the level above it he'd be comfortably at home he went through some injuries in his last year at Chelsea before going out on loan seems to have overcome them he had one absence last year but it was nothing to do with his previous issues as far as I'm aware Uh, and good luck to him if he does he's a Northern Ireland international and from a relatively small talent pool there he'll probably enjoy a strong international career as he continues to develop Henry was really really good for the development squad and then went out on loan went to Wimbledon did well went to Milton Keynes and did well enough and in a season that nobody there expected them to go as they did he'll be in demand because he's this Swiss army knife of a player you can plug into any defensive or midfield role perfect squad player for a 46 game season Um, Juan Castillo probably would have left Chelsea a while ago had it not been for injuries got injured last preseason didn't come back until the new year Chelsea looked after him as they are want to do and um, I think 23 years old he'll move on this summer I think his big opportunity came when he went on loan to Ajax and played for their B team in the Eerste Divisie the second tier in the Netherlands played at left back for them all season statistically super impressive uh, and there was a 600,000 euro option to buy that they declined and everyone was quite surprised by that uh, and things just have been uncertain for him ever since and if he can recapture that player that he was at that point he'll have a, a ton of options back in the area of I'm certain and, and Derek Abu who is an interesting enough story he had a trial at Crystal Palace back in April helped them through to the uh, under 21 international cup final was scored in a penalty shootout for them but on the side of that he has a really burgeoning music career under the name Chosen um, there's been a bit of coverage about it on Chelsea's website and on social media he uh, was out in Ibiza and a couple of weeks ago playing on the stage there and that's really going well for him so he's got plenty of options on and off the pitch like we spoke about with Mendel Adobo. these outside endeavours from football that are incred- incredibly encouraged by the player care department at Chelsea the, the, the advocate for these boys to be more than just footballers to be everything that you can be and to support all of these other interests and you see it first at hand with the way that Derek's musical career has taken off so while he will be leaving this Chelsea Chelsea this summer he'll still be a friend of the club and um, I'm hopeful that he's successful on and off the pitch because he's he's a really good kid I love that yeah and we have talked about it didn't and they promoted it right I mean the club yeah they played a couple in. of his songs at PL2 games yeah um and they've done a few articles about it on the website. It's it's really really cool to see that they're supporting it. Not, I mean, obviously they'd be supporting it inherently, but to give it a platform, give it a stage, give it a presence on their channels, is super uplifting for for Derek as well. Yeah. Um, okay. The rest of the bucket: uh, Joe Haig, Thomas Fiabemba, Mother Sill, which we already talked about, and then Jaden Wareham. Uh, those are your midfielders slash attackers to kind of round out this bucket. Yeah, Joe has been a personal favourite of mine just to to watch as an under-18 player and hasn't really had the best time of it with the development squad. Went to Derby for a little bit on loan and got injured and came back and didn't get back to fitness in time to play for Chelsea and it seems like he'll go. Silco Thomas is another one who's been really impactful as a a wing-back or a winger under-18 level. And even when he played in the development squad, he, he did well enough but just hasn't had... The, the opportunities to kick on he went on trial to Sheffield United back in I think January or February I think the exit door was open from that point Fia Bema, really interesting one this time last year he was on loan at Rosenborg in in Norway which is where he's from he's an under 21 international there and as one of the biggest clubs in Norway it was a pretty good opportunity for him they had an option to buy and then sort of really unexpectedly towards the end of the summer window they pulled out of that 
anyone on loan to Forest Green in the in League One, English third tier, and didn't really play there. He scored a goal in the EFL Trophy, came back in January, went into the development squad and played once right at the back end of the season. So in the space of a calendar year, he went from potentially establishing himself as a squad option for a good team in Norway to having this uncertain future. And I don't know if you can really call it a wasted year, but he's a player who, as an under-18 at Chelsea, flashed plenty of potential, plenty of these... Mod- I, I think I compared him as a as a physical playing style and not in any other way to sort of Dominic Solanke. They move similarly. They provide the same ability to play as a nine or slightly off. Um, and that, that type of player, and it just didn't kick on. He, he played well enough when he got to the development squad at Chelsea. It's just since he went on loan to to Rosenborg, and he did okay there for a, for a little bit. It just seemed to go awry. And there might be other things that play that none of us are privy to, so we can't speak on it too much. And I'm confident that he'll settle somewhere in the next year or two and show why he was relatively highly sought after by Chelsea and other clubs because there's plenty of modern prototypical striker about him uh, and Jay Wareham who made the long circuitous route into elite category one academy football he was a youngster at QPR got released went into Woking in the non-league worked exceptionally hard there got into the first team as a 17 year old they got a trial at Chelsea and early trial at Chelsea and we've spoken about him before as this striker who will run all day chase lost causes put himself into painful position score the dirty goals sniff out all those chances and be a fantastic teammate and that's exactly what he's been at Chelsea he went on loan to Leighton Orient didn't play as much there because Orient were a much better team than I think even they'd anticipated. They ran away with promotion and as the fourth striker and a fourth striker rotation in that sort of team, the minutes are hard to come by. He played, scored a couple of goals in the backup cup competitions, was going to switch to Wimbledon in the January window, as I understand it. And then Wimbledon signed another striker who worked out really well for them in the end. Jay came back to Chelsea, got injured. Um, if it is his time to move on, as I'm understanding it, then he'll go with... Uh, plenty of good memories and a, a really good platform to go in and be uh, an infectious character and goal scorer for a decent team. League One, National League level to start with, I guess, but you know, whoever gets in will get a decent young goal scoring forward. All right, two names you didn't talk about that I'm interested in. And maybe because one of them we covered on our, so like maybe you get a pass, but the first one is David Dautra Fafana is clearly listed on the dev squad. What do you make of his role within the different options at Chelsea? I think he goes on loan next season. Um, He's played two games for the dev squad. And I wanted to say he kind of played out of position because he played off the left with Bursto as the nine. But the way he's been playing for the Ivory Coast in the Toulon tournament is kind of the same role. And he's surprisingly effective at it. He's got a, a decent range and vision of pass and could do a lot more than you think as just this centre nine. Um, they were talking about a loan back in January for him. And he probably should have got on loan. I don't know where he'll end up on loan, but it'll be one of those mid-tier leagues. And we talked about Strasbourg earlier. If that materialises then in time then going into the second tier in France would be a great option for him the French league in general probably seems like a decent opportunity if you can find one Uh, I didn't see enough of him in the development squad to really be able to say more than what I think everybody knows him to be he almost played within himself a little bit Um, but at the same time you can look at players like that sometimes and they're a little bit laconic and think that they're playing within themselves He, he looked at least half a step ahead of some of the Devetsu Def Squad players, but similarly, like you could attribute Burstow and say that they were relatively as good as each other. Uh, I think the fact that Chelsea paid a premium for for Fana and not for Burstow will speak to the opportunities they get this summer, fairly or unfairly. But I don't think he's ready for meaningful minutes at Chelsea this season unless we go into the scenario that we talked about earlier where Pochettino kind of writes off this entire season and plays all of the kids and he'd be included in that until Amanda Breuer's back and then they can fight it out but I don't think that's going to happen for a lot of reasons he is only 20 right so he is a young guy uh, with a lot of developing still to do Chelsea bought for the future significantly in January. We know that. So just a question. All right. Do you know which player 
do you think that I'm going to bring up that we haven't talked about yet? We've got hundreds of them, so no. If I say Ethan Ampadu and it's not Ethan Ampadu, then we can talk about Ethan Ampadu. It's not, even though you were willing him to not get relegated. I saw on Twitter, Lewis Hall. Lewis Hall, yeah. Where do you? Um, where does he fit in your plans, Phil? I think my absence from including him in the development squad chat means I've made the internal assumption that he is a first team squad player and should be treated as such and should absolutely not be loaned out and given every opportunity to build on a really, really promising nine, ten games this past season because. If we're talking about a meritocracy, he is very high up the list of positives from a very negative 22-23 campaign. He finished the season playing... I'm, I don't even like saying that left-back isn't his position anymore because when you play like he plays at left-back, <laughs> you've made that position your own. It's, it's a bonus hard to argue. the opportunity to play in midfield where you want to play <laughs> and where you are really good as well. But it's hard to argue with the results of what we've seen in that position. That's what I thought. I mean, that was my assumption, right? But it's like, I want Matson. I want Ian in the squad. Like, that means you obviously someone's got to go, right? And, I, and I'm and i not going to name names. I think we're all aligned on who we think should go. Um, in, in, in that case, though, you almost think of like a Ruben Loftus-Cheek maybe. He can play middle. He can play wide. Uh, if Ruben does go, if Kovacic goes, uh, if, heaven forbid, Mason goes, like, you're gonna need depth in midfield if Angolo Conte now goes and so he might you know kind of have like forced his way into those plans because you know what's funny Phil most Chelsea fans have never seen him play in the center of the park oh for sure and like, I can see the argument for a loan move I can see the benefits for it but at the same time in a season where Chelsea are going to be pushing for top four at best you find out what you've got in your homegrown player that might save you having to make other decisions further down the line. I don't think it's... If if you're talking about deserving opportunities, he's ticked every box. And you go into a season where a lot of players will have a lot to prove and we're, we're signing young players from around the world at exorbitant cost in some cases who are going to get some of these opportunities. You've got one who's come through and played as well as anybody else. Surely, if you're talking about deserving minutes, then he's right at the top of the pile. It doesn't mean you have to start him for 38 league games, but like, if you can't find 15 to 20 starts in all competitions next year in, let's say, a 46-game season being generous with cup runs, then I think something's gone really wrong because we talk about opportunities will be given to those who have proven they can deserve it. And that's, in some cases, going on several loans and ticking all the boxes. And like Ian Martson, he deserves the same opportunity. And yet you can't play all of the left-backs. But let's at least try to exploit the fact that Martson and Hall are both comfortable playing in a myriad of different roles and see what you've got in them in a season where you'd like to answer a lot more questions and know what you've got going into 24-25. He's 18. Line him up. Premier League ready, tested and proven, honestly. And it's, it's a really interesting point that you say, yeah, he's 18 and Daltro's 20 and Harvey Vale's 19. They've, they've been around and we've been talking about them on this podcast for a long, old time and people forget that they are still that young. It feels like they've been around forever. And then Ethan Ampadu, he's 22, he'll be 23 in September, still really young. How? How? <laughs> People look at 23-year-olds because Ethan was playing football at, for Exeter at 15. That is a long time, but that doesn't mean that 23 is old. He's had oh. experience at Leipzig, at Sheffield United, at Vicenza, and sorry, Vicenza, Venezia, pardon me, and, and now Svezia. And fine, three relegations in a row doesn't particularly reflect well, but... Worked for Aaron Ramsdale. You look at the player... Don't evaluate the situation, evaluate the talent. And again, if you're talking about spending 60 million on a defensive midfielder who isn't top of your list, why would you compromise when you've got somebody of 170 senior games who's played at a World Cup and played at a European Championships? Find out what you've got in-house before you spend. The spending should be the decision you make after you've decided that you haven't got exactly what you're looking for. You know what the problem with that is at Chelsea right now, Phil? Uh Uh-huh. You bought a bunch of sporting and technical directors and scouts that are have to prove themselves. And the only way they can prove themselves is to bring in players that they put their name on. 
Potentially. I, I would always argue that a good sporting director will say, well, we manage the squad. We believe that these players that the club already own are good enough. Go and work with them. They prove they succeed and you are part of the overall success. It's not about individual success if you put your ego aside. I can't speak as to whether everybody hired by Chelsea has ego. I, obviously, there is a level of ego within football inherently, but we'll find out because ultimately the team's success is your success if the team isn't successful your reputation goes with it yeah well we'll, we'll see um that's just kind of my theory on on how it's going and that's when we talked to matt and as and everybody they said pretty much everyone they brought in from a, a backroom staff got to their own signing in january and it looks like it so we need to get a little bit consistently shake it out neil bath for president if that's even an option i don't know how you guys run it over there phil but i appreciate you as always keep sell loan academy edition with phil at chelsea youth uh it has been fun sir it's been an absolute pleasure as always. All right. Well, let us know what you think of the shuffling in the academy. Again, some of it's just natural, right? Just natural progression through the youth ranks. Uh, some of it is going to be us to test how good some of those young, talented players cast today, right? We even talk about Andre Santos, who Chuck make his name was dropped a little bit. Um, but Omari Hutchinson, right? Uh, you know, Charlie Webster, can we turn this around? Uh, in some of those amazing positions. So go back. Uh, we got a lot more of the, the Academy Roundup from previous seasons or previous episodes this season. So go check it out, as always, at Chelsea Youth on Twitter. But until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high.